Hi, Dr. Stefano. Um, this is going to be my second in brief on the Trinity, and I thought I would try teaching the lesson to my wife um, to see how she would do. This is really the first time I've ever gone through it with somebody else besides what we did in class, so hopefully I do okay. So today we're going to talk about the Blessed Trinity, and what we're going to do is we're going to give you seven steps to understanding the sacred mystery of how one of one God and three persons, okay, the Blessed Trinity. So, you might ask yourself, how can three equal one? Is this even the correct question to ask? That's something we have to ask ourselves. And what we have to realize is that the Trinity is not a math problem because three does not equal one. It, it just doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through how the Trinity actually works. <clears throat> so, the first thing we need to do is we need to know what is the Catholic claim for the Trinity? What do we claim as Catholics? We claim that God is three who's and one what. So three who's and one what. Here's a question for you. What are you? A human. Very good. You're a human. Sometimes we have to get people to think about that. So we might ask, like, you know, are you, because you might say, you know, I'm a wife, I'm a, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. But in this case, we didn't have to lead you any further. But yes, you are a human. That's great. Human is what you are. Who are you? Chrissy. Chrissy, because that's your name. Christine, but we call you Chrissy, so that's your name. So that's who you are. Your name makes you who you are. You know, there could be a Johnny, a Susie, a Billy, a Jamie, you know, etc. But the name gives us who we are and what we are is human. Everything good so far. All right. So how does this work when we talk about God? Because it's going to be different. For God, we ask, what are you? And what is God? God. God. He's, he's spirit. He's God. That, that, that's it, you know. And, and, and it's different than when we think of like a human or a tree or something because um, that's, um, uh, you, you know, God is, 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 is something that's beyond this, this world. So it's, it's a little bit harder. But we, we call God God. That's the name that we give, give to God. And if we ask God, who are you? He would say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what he is, is God, and who he is, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are the three who's, and I'm going to explain this more for you. So if you just take a look, a quick little chart here, remember when we're talking about humans, the what is, they're human, for God, the what is God. For the human, who they are is your name, and the same with God, it's basically what we would refer to them as names as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so far? Okay. So, let's try this again. So this is our Trinity, okay? I made this little little uh, thing here, so let's see if it works. So over here, if I said to you, what is this? What would you say this is? What is this? God. God, correct. And who would this be? Father. Father. So notice, you've got God. And you've got Father. How about here? What is this? God. And who is it? The Son. Son. And how about over here? God. The Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit. Oh, I, Son, that's supposed to say Holy Spirit. I, Sorry, Dr. Spano, I wrote the wrong word. That's supposed to say Holy Spirit. I'll fix it. So if you ask yourself, how many what's do we have up there? One. One what? Because what is the same for all of them? How many who's do we have? Three. So the Catholic claim that there is one what and three who's shows you that's the, the Trinity, okay? And like I said, I'll fix that. I, I didn't realize I did that. Okay, so what does it mean to be a who for a human, okay? When we think of humans, we think of humans as individuals, okay? Now, for example, let's say we have... Tom, Jerry, Billy, and Susie, and they're eating. We would say that there are four individuals eating. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, because there's a Tom, Jerry, Billy, and Susie, four different ones. 
So humans are individuals who, so they're individuals first and then they enter into a relation. So think of it like this. The relation for Tom, Jerry, Billy, and Susie is that of being friends or maybe they're siblings, maybe they're classmates. But if you think about it, at first, they are individuals. They're all individuals who then join into some sort of relation or relationship with, with some other individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the definition of an individual is, is being undivided in itself, but divided from every other. Okay? So being undivided in itself and divided from every other. So what does that mean? We're going to use this paper as, a, as an example. So if I were to ask you now, how many, how many uh, paper units of paper, how many individual papers do I have? One. I have one, correct? All right. And we know that because it's undivided in itself and it's, uh, uh, it's divided from every other, right? How about now? What if I did this to it? How many pieces of paper do we have? Still one, right? I mean, it may have a tear in it, but it's still just one, right? So it's still one, but it's undivided in itself and separate from others. What if I did this? How many pieces of paper do I have now? Two. Two, right? Because this is undivided in itself, so that's one. And this is undivided in itself, and that's two, because they are, um, they are divided from every other. So this is divided from this one. Okay, and if I did this, we didn't do a very good job. How many? Three. Three, okay, very good. So I think you've got that down. So when we count an individual, we're counting a unit. Okay, again, individual, we tear it in half, and now we've got two units, okay? That's how we count individuals, okay? So again, we had one unit of paper, one individual, then when I tore it in two, we had two units. If I did it again, it'd be three, it could be four, et cetera, okay? Because we're, we're, we are undivided in, our, in itself and divided from every other, okay? So what does it mean to be a who for God? Now, this is going to be different. It means to be in relations, not... The, so the, the, what they are is because of their relations, and we're going to explain it like this. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not individuals who enter into a relation, okay? So it's not like the Father was, uh, you know, he was there and uh, all of a sudden he becomes Father because he joins in this relationship or relation with the Son. That's, no, no, no. He is Father. That, he, that is what he is. He is Father. Same thing with the Son. The Son is not an individual that, you know, so here's the Father and here's the Son and they're just kind of, hanging out there, and then all of a sudden they come together and say, hey, I'm the father, you're the son. Now that's that's because we have that relation. That's not what it's about. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so that's really important because the father and son and the Holy Spirit are not individuals. We can't count them like we count, you know, in units or like we do people. They are what we call subsisting relations, which we're going to get into in a couple of minutes. And what's a subsisting relation? It's basically, the definition means relations that exist concretely as persons. And person, the way we think about it, is going to be a little bit different than, than um, in, in, in this regard than what we think of a person when it comes to, um, like how we talk today. I know that's a person, that's a person, that's a person, okay? But we're going to get there. So the father, this is important, the Father is the Father from all eternity because that is who He is from all eternity. So from all eternity, the Father's been the Father. He's always been the Father. He's the Father. The Son is the Son from all eternity and that is who He is from all eternity. From all eternity, you have the Father and He's always the Father and the Son is always the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit from all eternity because that's who he is from all eternity. So how does this affect the way I think of about God? So let's say we have three people in the room. To the first one, I would ask, 
who are you? And they might say, John. And I might say, what are you? Human. Then I might say to the next one, who are you? Mary. Mary. <laughs> and what are you? Human. And then the third one I might say, who are you? Susie. Susie. And what are you? Human. Human. So in this way, how many humans would we have in the room? Three, because we have three individuals, because again, they're undivided in themselves, but they're separate or divided from every other. I'm my own human, you're your own human, you're your own human. Okay. So again, we're going to count them as individuals, and individuals is the basis of a unit, and that's how we count. We count everything like that. Got one block, two block, three blocks, four blocks. Everything is done in individuals. Because again, the unit is the basis for counting. So how about how I think about God? We're on step three. Is God an individual? No, he is not. Therefore, we cannot count God by using units. We can't say, okay, there's God, but there's one father, and then there's you know God, there's the second God, Jesus, and the third God, the Holy Spirit. Because then we'd have three gods, but we have what? One. One God, exactly. So God defines, or excuse me, redefines what oneness and threeness mean, and they're in a communion, okay? So they're, the three persons are in one, and it's a communion. So, as we'd like to say, we need to heal the way we think about the Trinity itself. So, again, the Trinity is not a math problem, and you've probably seen like the pretzel thing, right? When they take the three pretzels, right? That, 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 that's like three gods. Okay? So it's not really a good analogy. The Trinity is about understanding what a subsisting relation means. So let's take a look at it. So again, we're going to start with individuals. If I say to you, because you're a human, you're an individual. If I say to you, to have is to gain, would you agree with me? Yeah. And to, loo to give is to lose. So, because if you think about it, you know, why? What's human, you know, preservation per se? Just using this as an example. So, having more food helps me pre preserve my individual life. And if I give away my food, that could jeopardize my individual life. So, I want to keep and I don't want to give away. That's, that's what an individual does. However, in a subsisting relation, it's the exact opposite, which makes it a paradox. Because again, you would think you want to preserve everything about yourself. But in this, re in this regard, when we talk about God, to lose is to gain. That's weird, right? Like how do you lose something and gain something? And to give is to win. Now that doesn't make any sense, right? Except... We have to look at who the divine persons are. The divine person is who he is because he gives himself away entirely, completely for all eternity. What does that mean? So for all eternity, the father has given himself away completely, completely has given himself away to the son all that he is and all that he has to the son, except what it is to be father. That's his relation. He's father. So he gives the son everything except father. That's his. The son, for all eternity, has been actively receiving that gift of the father, has been actively uh, taking in what you know the father's love, and the son completely surrenders himself to the father. He surrenders himself completely in return. Everything that he is, except to be the son, because that's his relation. So to lose is to gain. So the father is losing. It's not really, I mean, we're using our words because he's giving everything. It's like loss. And who's gaining? Well, the father, because his love is going to the son and the son is gaining when he gives, he surrenders himself back. And so from all eternity, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son's loving surrender as both the fruit and the witness. So the Holy Spirit is there to basically witness 
this complete surrender of the Father and the Son. Okay? The Father is the I, the Son is the you, and together the Holy Spirit is the we because it makes the three. It shows the communion of the three. The Holy Spirit, again, is the we because he proceeds from the I and the you, and he witnesses their communion. So, people, uh, uh, let's see here. Humans are called to be divine, and I know that sounds crazy, right? Because you're like, we're not supposed to be gods. I mean, we're, we're humans. We're, we're, we're not supposed to be, you know, elevated like that. But we truly are called to be divine. I know that seems like a you know, an oxymoron, but it, but it's not. How? Because we are supposed to be like God. What does that mean? Imagine now, imagine if you gave yourself away totally as a self-gift to the other for the other's sake. You would be like God. You would be divine because that's what God makes God is he completely, the Father completely gives himself away totally to the other, the son, except for father. And think about it, if like in a relationship, imagine if, you know, husband and wife, if they do that, that's kind of, you know, what you're supposed to do in a sense when, when you get married, that's kind of the bond. But that's, that's what it means to be divine. So the goal of the Christian life is this, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See the, 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 uh, the paradox there? To lose is to gain. To gain is to lose. Okay? And the gospel paradox really is, is that I am only my truest self. I'm my truest self when I completely give myself away. And that's what Jesus did. For example, make a fist. Now open it. When you did that, <clears throat> this is what it's like to be in the communion of saints and what the communion of saints is all about. Can you look at your fingers? Are they in isolation, your fingers? Now they're the body of Christ, right? Are they not? This is what it means to be part of the body of Christ, okay? They are the saints. They are divine by their total self-gift configured with the total self-gift of Christ, meaning they have given themselves completely, and in that regard, they also have been kind of combined, in a sense, or put together with the total self-gift of Christ. And that is, you know, the beginning of the Trinity. I know this is the basics of it and something that we're going to learn more about as we go on next year and take a class in it. But so, um, Professor Stefano, um, Dr. Stefano, excuse me, um, hopefully this went well. I, I'm truly looking forward to your critique because this is something I really want to learn and understand more. And I know I still have some struggles and maybe I didn't quite clarify myself mm -hmm. enough, but um, that was my best effort uh, for what I know now. Thank you.